Tim Legler back with us. Should Joel Embiid have been eject, plain and simple, should he have been thrown out of the game for that? Yeah, he should have been ejected for that. Uh, you know, and look, I know he was provoked. Clacton stepped over him, but that's an intentional kick to the groin area. Now, it just so happens that he missed his target. I, but to me, when you're trying to make this determination, it should just be intent. What was his intent in kicking Claxton in that situation? I agree with Jock Vaughn. You just don't see guys stay in the game after something like that. So it was very surprising to me. And maybe, look, maybe Joel Embiid had this right because. Once they went to the cameras and made the ruling, Joel Embiid started pointing at, I guess, his name on the back of his jersey. Maybe he's right. He's saying, listen, I'm Joel Embiid. They're not throwing me out for that because it seemed like maybe something there played into it because it was obvious to me. And I think any officiating crew typically sees something like that. They go look at the replay and they see the intent behind it. A guy's going to be ejected. Now, the suspension would be a different thing. Draymond's past history played into it. Joel Embiid doesn't really have a past history of these types of things. So the suspension is a different discussion, but the flat out ejection flagrant two in the moment. Yeah, I think that should have been the case. After covering Draymond Green in the 2016 playoffs and all the various kicks he had to Steven Adams, I thought I was done with this thing. And after last night, I'm clearly not. We're back to judging groin kicks and whether somebody <laughs> kicked a guy or where he kicked them or what happened. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I, I think to Tim's point, the fact that Joel Embiid didn't quite connect is probably why the refs decided not to uh, throw him out of the game. I mean, I, Tony Brothers, the, the crew chief last night, essentially said as much after the game. But between this play and the James Harden play, I, it was just a very confusing night at the at the Barclays Center in terms of how the referees were adjudicating these these it, calls. It was, and you were there uh, watching it uh, from the front row. There, the, the, you mentioned the James Harden. Let, let's. Let's get to that, because James Harden, uh, if you listen to what he has to say here, did not believe he should have been ejected from the game. Like, unacceptable flagrant, too. Like, the first time I've been ejected, I'm not labeled as a dirty player. You know what I mean? I didn't hit him in a private area. Um, if somebody's draped on you like that defensively, it's just a natural bas basketball reaction. Honestly, I don't even think it was a foul on me, but, um, yeah, that's unacceptable. That, that can't happen. Well, just for clarity, because I couldn't remember exactly what he said, when Tony Brothers was asked after the game about the Joel Embiid play, mm -hmm. the contact was deemed unnecessary and based on the point of contact to the leg, it didn't rise to the level of excessive. Whereas for James Harden, it was based on the point of contact directly to the groin. So that's where we're at. We're adjudicating where in the where leg you or got the groin hit. we're hit. Yeah, so, all right. That, you, you were at the game, as I said. When, 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 the, when Harden was thrown out, what was the reaction in the building? Stunned. I mean, everybody on press row was was absolutely stunned. I, I thought it was a I, maybe going to be an offensive foul. I, I mean, I guess you could maybe say it was a flagrant one. Nobody thought James Harden was getting ejected, including James Harden, who after the game was obviously very upset when he was talking about it. But I mean, look, at the end of the day, the NBA has created the situation where players are now incentivized to try to get these flagrant foul reviews because you accrue flag or foul points during the playoffs that can lead to suspensions down the road. And it also gets you two points in the ball back in the game. So this is something the NBA is now set up to where this is gonna happen over and over and over again. We saw it a few times last night. We've got 11 games over the next three days. We're gonna see it a bunch of times over the weekend too. Tim, what, what do you think Draymond Green was thinking as he was watching the Sixers Nets brouhaha unfold? I can't imagine Draymond Green's reaction when Joel Embiid was not ejected from that game. I would have loved to have been a fly on a wall wherever Draymond Green was last night watching that because I know he was anticipating that. Like, at minimum, this has to be an ejection, and it wasn't. So, yeah, obviously he's upset. The Warriors are, are probably livid over the fact. Um, they've got enough issues on their own hands right now in that series, so they're not going to get too caught up in this, but there's no doubt they had discussions about it, and they feel like th this was not – uh, justice was not evenly served in this in these two examples. So yeah, he had to be livid. The Harden play uh, to me, that's completely obviously unintentional. I mean, nobody's going to try to ring the bell with one hand while they're dribbling the ball with the other hand. All right, that's just not going to happen. Um, and that to me should have been. If you want to call an offensive foul, fine. No way, that's a flagrant. And certainly, if you're going to go flagrant, stop at one and keep James Harden in the game. That was one of the most bizarre ejections I have seen. Not much different. Than 
than a guy driving to the rim, lifting his knee or his foot up into the chest of a defender. At most, you're going to get an offensive foul or a flagrant one. You're not going to see guys ejected for that. I don't see any difference here with Harden. So much time this week spent about should it be flagrant one, should it be flagrant two, should it be an ejection? Should how about if we all just stop kicking and hitting each other? Like would that be a, would that be helpful? Nice. Is, is that a possibility? <laughs> if they lost the game, they're down three games to none, which is what he's referring to. I didn't, nobody's ever come back from that in basketball, right? That's correct. So Tim Legler, they did not lose the game. They won it. So does this now set them up to be in a position to win this series, or do you need to see more to believe it? Well, look, at some point, they're going to have to win a road game. That's what it comes down to, uh, to win this series. So th to be in perfect position to win the series at this point, to make that statement, they would have had to split in Sacramento. They didn't do that. So what they have done is put themselves back in it, and now the pressure will start to mount against the Sacramento Kings. Um, and look, what had to happen in this game, Steph Curry had to be a vintage Steph Curry, and that's what he was. He was the best player on the floor. He outplayed De'Aaron Fox, which was critical, but they needed more than that. It wasn't just going to be Curry because they didn't shoot the ball particularly well across the board. There had to be an X factor. Who was that going to be? Where was it going to come from? Kevon Looney gave him that. He was the dominant player in the, in the paint. Nine offensive rebounds, a number of which led to directly to points off of his assist from the rebound. You saw the one at the end of the half. Huge momentum shift there. It's a nine-point game. Instead, Kings don't get a stop. Instead, now Curry hits a three. You're down 12 going into halftime, and the building is rocking as the guys leave the court. So you cannot put a value on what Kevon Looney did in this game. They don't win it without his performance. You heard Steph Curry talk in that clip about pride and about dealing with distractions. This is not the first time the Golden State Warriors and Steph Curry have had to deal with Draymond Green causing distractions. <laughs> And Steph Curry is one of the most prideful players and one of the greatest players the NBA has ever seen. And this was about Steph Curry, as Tim said, putting his team on his back and carrying them over the line. You knew he was, I thought he was going to do this going into this game because he's an all-time great player. And this is what all-time great players do. And to me, the Sacramento Kings had a chance to put away the defending champs last night. You've asked about the 3-0 stat before. Yeah. The fact that they didn't, I think Golden State is coming back and winning this series because they got a chance to get off the mat, and they did. I'm with you about one thing. I was... Pretty confident Golden State was going to go in that game somehow. Uh, you you got to knock out the champ to beat the champ. The Sun starters have played the most minutes of any team's starting unit and have accounted for nearly 90% of the team's scoring. Booker and KD lead the playoffs so far in minutes played, each at 44 per game. Even Chris Paul, who turns 38 in two weeks, is averaging 39 minutes a night. So listen, you got to win this series, and then you got to win a few more, and they can go longer. Uh, so legs, all these starter minutes, all these minutes these guys are playing. You know, they, they went all in for Durant, and they have this superstar team, but they're leaning hard on him. Do you think that comes back to bite these Suns? You know, normally, I would say no. I, I'm one of those guys that I just don't want to hear about minutes. I, you know, it drives me insane anytime the topic comes up. Normally, this is a little bit different because this is pretty extreme. You're talking about guys averaging, you know, 40 minutes a night, particularly Chris Paul. That's where my main concern would be because he has a history of breaking down in the postseason. And the deeper you get, if he continues to play these kinds of minutes, uh, he could face some problems down the road. And they don't have a lot of depth. They don't have a lot of answers at point guard, certainly. But you do have Kevin Durant and Devin Booker to run your offense through to give Chris Paul a little bit more extended time. I'm not as concerned about it with Kevin Durant. He just had a lot of rest. He was out for a long time with an injury. And one of the byproducts of missing time with an injury is your legs are fresher. And we've seen guys benefit from that in the past. So I'm not too worried about Durant. I'm certainly not worried about Devin Booker or DeAndre Ayton. Chris Paul is the guy I'm looking at. And one of the reasons I, I was excited for him when they got Kevin Durant, I thought it would preserve him more because he wouldn't have to be as aggressive offensively. So that's one that I want to look at if I'm Monty Williams. That number can't be around 40 minutes a game, which is where it's at right now. Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Chris Paul all have significant histories now of muscle injuries. I think all of them playing over 40 minutes a night is not a recipe for success over the long term. As Legs points out correctly, the Suns don't have a lot of depth. The fact that they all needed to play over 40 minutes to beat a kawhi -less Clippers team on Thursday night is not a great sign. By the way, this series comes back early afternoon tip in L.A. on Saturday. 36 hours basically after the end of game three. All these guys are going to have a lot of miles on their tires coming off that game. 
So to me, the Clippers or the Suns have to win these next two games, get this series over with, and get to that series against Denver with as much rest as possible before they have to go into altitude and play the top seeded Denver Nuggets in the second round. You mentioned that the Clippers were without Kawhi Leonard, who kind of a surprise uh, at, yesterday yep. afternoon. We found out he wasn't going to play uh, because of a knee issue. Legs, if he can't play in game four, is that it? Are the Clippers done? Yeah, that's it. Phoenix and Phoenix will sense that moment. And Kevin Durant is the ultimate when it comes to having a killer instinct and knowing the moment. And they know if Kawhi Leonard doesn't play in that game, the Suns pretty much know they can win and go home, close it out. And that's going to shorten the series, which could be important when you look at, you know, potentially Denver, you know, may, might sweep that series. You're going to have to get as much rest as you can for all of the reasons that we just said, how thin they are on their bench, the minutes they've already played. Kawhi Leonard doesn't play in that game. Phoenix will understand the significance of the moment and being able to wrap that up when they go back home and make it a five-game series. Yeah, I think the question just comes down to how much of their legs are there on the Saturday afternoon right. game, 36 hours after all these guys played a ton of minutes. You saw Chris Paul was 5 for 18 from the field. He was 1 for 8 from 3. It was, you know, it seemed like he was dealing with a hand issue he had earlier in the series. We'll see where he's at. But, yeah, I mean, look, if the Suns are able to muster enough energy, they're clearly the better team, and they might be the better team even if Kawhi Leonard is playing. Certainly without him, they should win that game and close the series out in Game 5. All right, on to another Western Conference Game 3 now. That, that Lakers-Memphis series resumes tomorrow. Which Anthony Davis are the Lakers going to get in Game 3? After, after he dominated Game 1, Davis shot 29% from the floor in Game 2. It was the worst field goal percentage in his playoff career. Still holding it down defensively, though, as he has already blocked 12 shots uh, in this series. So, Legs, when we look at the Lakers, what, what do we make of Anthony Davis and, and his performance so far in this series and, and what he needs to do going forward? Yeah, I just didn't think he had great energy. The other night, I thought that he accepted the double teams a little bit too easily, and he didn't take advantage of other ways that he can, you know, avoid the double teams, which is run the floor, get up, get something in transition, running the floor, also get on the offensive glass. Those are two areas that, that the double team won't come into play. He seemed to be pretty content to pop out to the wing, catch it, understand a double was coming, and then just give it up. And that was the end of the possession for Anthony Davis. Can't be. He's too talented. Uh, he's a guy that can put his stamp all over the game on both ends of the floor. His mindset has to be different. Collectively, their team mindset has to be different about Anthony Davis. It needs to go through him, but he needs to help himself by having a better energy level and finding other ways that he can put points on the board rather than just catch it, understand he's going to get doubled and give it up. He, he has to be more forceful when this game starts. You'll be able to tell right away where he's at. Look, there's going to be a lot of talk over the next 36 hours or so about Dylan Brooks and Dylan Brooks and LeBron James and poking the bear and all that stuff. If we're talking about Dylan Brooks and LeBron James after game three, I think Memphis is going to have won the game. If Anthony Davis is the story from game three, then the Lakers are going to be happy and they should be up two to one in the series. Just to me, this series comes down to one very simple thing. If Anthony Davis is the best player on the court, the Lakers are going to win. And if he's not the best player on the court, the Lakers are going to lose. That's how game one and two went. I think it's how the rest of the series is going to go. And he, to me, is the key to the entire series. I don't want to hear about Dylan Brooks if I'm the Lakers. I don't want to hear about LeBron James. It's got to be about Anthony Davis, to, to, to Tim's point. They got to get him involved, get him involved early and often throughout the game. Because if he's playing the way he did in game one, they should come back. They, they very well can, I should say, win this series. You don't want to hear about Dylan Brooks, but Dylan Brooks makes sure that, that you do. Listen, Dylan Brooks makes sure you talk about it. No question about so, that. Like, he, he calls out LeBron after the game the other night. He says he likes to poke bears. He says the guy is old. He's not what he used to be. Like, what do you expect to see from LeBron after all this? Yeah, look, I think LeBron's smart enough not to get caught up into this where he goes out and gets out of his lane and in ways that he has to lead the team. He's not going to just turn this into a one-on-one -on -one versus Dylan Brooks. I, I agree with Bontemps completely. If that happens, Memphis has won, and Dylan Brooks has accomplished what he wanted to. But having said that, doesn't mean LeBron James can't go out there, get 35-40, and also control tempo, facilitate, right. get guys open three-pointers, and just clearly be the most dominant force on the floor. He can do that without obviously trying to make it about Dylan Brooks, and I think that that's what I expect LeBron James to do. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.